Is he great? Would you give him praise? Give him praise this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you believe that, you can sit down. Amen. <laughs> oh, God is so good. He is so good. We started out in the book of Nehemiah last week, and we're going to continue there. Uh, probably for quite some time, there's some things that I think that we really need to learn from Nehemiah. And um, Nehemiah is an interesting uh, a book in the Bible. Ezra and Nehemiah are actually um, one book uh, in the Hebrew Bible. In uh, the English Bible, there are two books, but they're, uh, those, that book, Ezra, and then the second half, Nehemiah, is, is actually um, part of uh, the only two completely historical uh, books in the Old Testament. Uh, it's complete history. Um, Ezra, and Nehemiah, and Daniel are written partly in Aramaic. Not that you really care about that, but it's interesting to understand that the common language of the day was Aramaic, and Jesus also spoke that. Um, they, they're the only books in the Old Testament, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Daniel, to be written in any Aramaic at all. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah chronologically are the last books of the Old Testament. So they're the last ones written. They don't appear lastly, but they were the last ones written. And they come just before a period of silence and before the arrival of John the Baptist and Jesus the Messiah. It was written 500 years um, B.C., before Christ. Um, it's interesting that it was the Babylonian exile where Ezra and Nehemiah were at. They were, they were slaves. They were indentured into another people. They had been taken from their homeland. Uh, it was prophesied by the prophet Jeremiah. And the Babylonian Empire fell and the Persian Empire gained power. And the return of the people of God was also prophesied by Jeremiah. And in fact, um, if you turn to Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, I won't read all those. I read those last week. Um, but verse 8, Nehemiah is praying and he's reminding God and he says, Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying... If you are unfaithful, and you can find this in Scripture, it's a direct quote from other Scripture. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen. I love this. To make my name dwell there. Did you know that God wants his name to dwell among us? His name is powerful, amen? The name of Jesus is powerful. You can see some of the words that we have around here, the, the Hebrew names of God all around our room. Um, he is Abba, he's Daddy, he's Elohim, amen? His name is powerful. His name is a direct reference of who and what he is, amen? So when we talk about the name of Jesus, we're not just talking about a name, we're talking about the name. There is no other name given among men whereby we can be saved. Our only hope is in the name of Jesus. You see, hopelessness comes, hopelessness comes when we are uncertain of our future. How many have ever been uncertain of our future? If you graduated from high school, you know what that feels like, right? Everybody's asking, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And you're too afraid to say, well, I plan on working at a gas station, actually. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. But the expectation is that, you know, uh, every graduation speech is, if you can dream it, you can be it, right? Is that right? You know, the commencement, you can do this. I've dreamed a lot of things. I'm just telling you, a lot of things that I've dreamed you cannot be. Pizza and late night is not good for your dreams, all I'm saying. 
But when you're uncertain of your future, you have hopelessness. Hopelessness. We first need a vision of Christ, and that's what we talked about last week, is we must see him as he really is. Amen? If you turn to Colossians 1.17, you can if you want, but Christ is the hope of glory. Jesus Christ is the hope of glory. He is our hope. He is the only hope. There is no other hope besides Christ. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Jesus is the answer for the world today. But pastor, you don't understand. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. Hi, how are you? You can help me preach. Right on. There you go. Jesus is the answer. Well, you don't know my need. I have, I have need of a job. Jesus is the answer. But you don't know about my marital situation. Jesus is the answer. Well, you don't know about my financial need. Jesus is the answer. Well, you don't know about my emotional need. Jesus is the answer. Now, there might be a lot of different ways to arrive at that, but Jesus is the only answer for the world today. In a lost and a dying world, Jesus is our only hope. He's it. If we take away Jesus, we're hopeless. We're even a really bad social club if we take Jesus out of the middle of this. Because if you don't have the Holy Spirit, there's only one other kind of spirit. Are you with me? When you have the Holy Spirit, you don't need the other kinds of spirit, amen? You don't need to be drunk. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will give you hope, amen? If you're struggling with alcohol, let me tell you, the reason that we have life-controlling situations is because Christ isn't controlling the situation. Some of you are going, yeah, but I just bought it. Pour it out. Let the Holy Spirit fill you. Amen? Amen. See, Christ is the hope of glory. He is our hope. And then next, if you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 12, I'm not going to read all those verses, and I think it's actually, there's a typo there, and I apologize for that. Ephesians, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 12, I'll turn there. Hebrews 12, and the whole chapter is really good, but I want to I key on a couple of verses that says, therefore, verse 1, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Sometimes there's things that are pulling us down and holding us back that aren't necessarily sin. They're just weights. They, <laughs> you don't go swimming in the swimming pool, weighted down with a vest and ankle weights and all that sort of thing. You have to release those things. There's sin and weights that so easily beset us. The King James Version said, lay aside all the sin and the weight that so easily clings to us or closely clings to us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. There's a race that's set before you, amen? Amen. So what do we do? How do we run this race? We look to Jesus. (coughs) We look to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Do you like that? Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Not Not only did he design your faith, but he will perfect your faith. When you first come to Christ... Man, I tell you, what a mess. But Jesus doesn't leave you there. He doesn't leave you in your sin. He doesn't leave you in your weights. What Jesus does is he redeems you. He pulls you out of that and he sets you on a higher plane. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Looking to Jesus, the the author and the perfecter of our faith, Who for the joy that was set before him. Underline that word in your Bible or highlight it on your phone or whatever device you have. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. 
There's the gospel message. What did Jesus do? He looked at you and he endured suffering. He endured a crucifixion. He endured pain with joy because of you. And now, not only did he die, but he was buried. And on the third day, he rose again. And when he rose again, he appeared to over 500 people. Remember those on the road to Emmaus? Did not our hearts burn within us? Jesus was talking to them and revealing all the scriptures to them about the Messiah. And they were like, I knew there was something about that guy. (laughs) Did not our hearts burn within us? Now, Jesus has gone to be with the Father. He is seated at the right hand of God. Do you know what that place is? That's the the place of power and authority, the right hand. You ever heard the, the, the words, well, this is my right hand man, right? Well, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, and he is forever making intercession for you. Do you know your name? So does Jesus, and so does the Father, because Jesus is proclaiming your name before the Father. Church, that's good news. That's good news. You say, oh, that's just not very practical. That's just not very practical, because there are 7 billion people in the world today. Yes, there are. And Jesus could handle a whole lot more. He knows your name. And he's reminding the Father of who and what you are in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? Amen. So for the joy that was set before him. Let's go on real quickly and, and uh, to, the, to verse 12. I don't want to skip over these, but I, I want to read this for purpose. And that is this. Therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. Even young men grow tired and faint. Amen? Even young men grow tired and faint. Therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. What God wants to do is take us from where we are and give us a place of hope. He wants to give us a house of hope. When we have hope, when we have Christ in us, he is the hope of glory. When we have Christ in us, we have a hope that the world needs. Hope. Hope is something that people can tangibly sense in you. Why are you so hopeful? Why are you so happy? Why do you have such peace? First Peter chapter one, as we continue on this morning, I'm not going to preach very long. But we're let God have his way this morning, amen. 1 Peter chapter 1. I would encourage you to follow up on these scriptures yourself, the Hebrews that I gave you. Nehemiah, if you would read through Nehemiah and Ezra. Um, Those are great books of the Bible that we'll be talking a lot about. Uh, Nehemiah had opposition. How many of you have ever had opposition in your life? How many are married? (laughs) None of the men raised their hands. Yeah. Yeah. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It, said, it says, Blessed be, and I'll read it out of the New Living Translation. It says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. Each one of us need God's mercy. It's by his mercy that we've been born again. Now, 
correlate that with John chapter 3, Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, he came to Jesus at night and he said, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, you must be born again. Nicodemus said, so hold on a second. I need to go into my mother's womb the second time and be born? This was a smart guy. But he didn't understand that he needed to be born of the Spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Amen? So we need to be born again. And the Spirit of God is what brings us to new birth in Christ. Amen? You must be born again. So all praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that you have been born again. Why? Why can we be born again? Because God raised Jesus from the dead. Get this. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is the dividing factor. Jesus wasn't just a good teacher. Jesus was the Son of God. If Jesus is still in the grave, we have no hope. We hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus died and he rose again. And here's the truth, you guys. If Jesus rose from the dead, so will you. Come on. Get that for a second. Think about it. What's the worst thing that could possibly happen to you? My mom used to threaten to take my birthday away. At the moment, it seemed bad. There's two things that are sure, they say, taxes and death. But church, when you're born again, death cannot touch you. We see things, we see things all, all skewed sometimes. We value what we see more than what we don't see. But the real value is in what we don't see, not in what we do see. This is so important that we understand this. God sees it differently than we do. As a pastor, as a minister, I get to do a lot of funerals. And one of the things that I always talk about is hope in the next life. Jesus died, and if we die, if like a seed that's buried in the ground, unless it dies, it won't rise again. Jesus was buried in the ground, and he rose again. And in his death, you too are going to be made like him. You've been buried with Christ, and you're going to rise again. Amen? That's the hope of glory, that we will someday be with him. So all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. Now we live with great hope. We have a priceless inheritance. What is an inheritance? It's a future promise, isn't it? It's a future promise. We have a priceless inheritance. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. I can't stop smiling, thinking about heaven, being with Christ. There's going to be no more sickness. There's not going to be Alzheimer's or old timers. There's not going to be dementia. There's not going to be cancer. There's not going to be harm done to one another. There's not going to be people that are emotionally beat down. In heaven, it's going to be perfect. We will be like him. There'll be no bum knees in heaven. There'll be no tears in heaven. 
after a thousand year millennial reign, every tear will be wiped from our eyes. There'll be no reason to cry. You'll be with him. Our hope is in Christ. Our hope is that we one day will be with him. Some of you have it pretty good. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> it ain't getting any better. Yeah, it is. It really is. Right now, it's just a glimpse of the glory which shall be. Scripture, scripture tells us this. Eye has not seen and ear has not heard and it has never entered into the mind of Walt Disney what God has prepared for those who love him. Amen. Hallelujah. Church, I want to fill you with hope today. Jesus is our hope, and one day you will be like him. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says that right now we see through a glass darkly. We don't understand, but one day we're going to see face to face. And we will know him even as he knows us. Hallelujah. That's the hope that we have. The hope that we have is Jesus. An inheritance. Imperishable. Undefiled. Unfading. Kept in heaven for you. As being guarded by God's power. Can I tell you that your salvation is secure in Jesus Christ? Your salvation is secure in Jesus Christ. It's guarded by God in heaven. Salvation belongs to our God. And he's not up there going, man, what did I do with that? I, I misplaced that somewhere. Boy, bummer for Al. Has anybody seen Al's salvation? Hey, Gabriel, come here. No. Salvation belongs to our God. And if you trust him, if you believe in him, you confess him with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, one day you're going to die and you're going to be with him. 1 Thessalonians tells us this. At, the, at that moment, the last trumpet will sound and the, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And then we which are alive and remain will caught up, be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And I love this part. And so shall we ever be with him. Oh, come on, church. We have a hope. We have a hope that goes beyond today. We have a hope that goes beyond the newscasts. We have a hope that goes beyond the destruction and mayhem that seems to be everywhere. Jesus is our hope. And one day soon we will see him face to face. Our hope rests on Christ alone. Glory. The good news is this today. Is that Jesus is with us. Jesus is with us. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles this morning to Mark Chapter 4. I don't rarely see Christians lose faith. But I do see Christians lose their hope. I've seen people pray about situations. Pray for healing. And the person that they were praying for dies. And I've seen Christians lose hope in that. I've heard people say, God doesn't answer my prayer. I think Christians lose hope first. They lose the hope that it's better than this life, that this life is just but a vapor that appears for a moment and then is gone. Some have stopped praying because their relationship has died. My children and my wife and I, we prayed for my brother for 20 years. We said, God, would you save, my kids would pray, God, would you save Uncle Mark? 20 years. After about the first day, 
I don't know if I really believed. Can I be honest? At times I would pray because the kids would say, don't forget Uncle Mark. And so we would pray for Uncle Mark. One year, five years, 10 years. Is, is that pretty accurate, Lisa? 20 years. Mom, is that pretty accurate? Oh, excuse me, 23. <laughs> Bless her little pink heart. <laughs> but we prayed. And I remember the day that God visited him and God saved him. Church, don't lose hope. We see through a glass darkly. We, we, we think that it's now, that it's drive through Jesus. Yeah, I'd like one of those uh, double salvation things. <laughs> don't lose hope, church. Don't lose hope. Because Christ is our hope. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. Familiar story. This is found in other of the Synoptic Gospels. Book of Luke also. There's also a parallel to this in Psalm 107. Verse 35 says in the English Standard Version, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And they were at the Sea of Galilee. I've been there. It's cool, isn't it, Dean? The Sea of Galilee. He's asleep. <laughs> Sorry, bro. My dad would say, if I put him to sleep, it's my job to wake him up. <laughs> the Sea of Galilee is where they were. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took with him, or excuse me, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, just like Dean. <laughs> and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? That was a great illustration, Dean. Thanks for that. Couldn't have planned that better. Do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea. Peace be still, he said. Get this. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you still afraid? Why are you still afraid? O ye of little faith. And they were filled with great fear and said to one another. Now this might have been a different type of fear, but they were filled with great fear and they said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obeys him? The things that are surrounding your life and in your boat and the storm that you're in is not nearly as important as who is in your boat. And if Jesus is in your boat, everything is going to be all right. If Jesus is in your boat, everything is going to be all right. I will not fear, the psalmist said, though the earth be removed and be carried into the midst of the sea. I will not fear. What's more important than your surroundings, what's more important than your present circumstance 
is that Jesus is with you and he promised that he would never leave you. He said, I will be with you till the end of the earth. I'm gonna conclude this morning with this, this scripture, Matthew 28. I got a whole lot more to preach. But if you all have me, I'll come back next week. Jason Hubbard's going to be here next week, a friend of mine from Washington. Yeah, he'll be here Saturday night for uh, Saturday Night Live. It's going to be a great time. He's going to be at the seniors' luncheon on Friday. Um, Jason is a, is a man of prayer, and I love when he hangs out with us. Matthew 28, 19, or 18, 19, and 20. You see, what we see directly affects how we act. What we see directly affects our action. Have you ever, have you ever seen like when the lights go out in New Orleans or something? Electricity? When there's a hurricane or, you know, riots in L.A., Chicago? People start smashing store windows. Remember the Rodney King incident? People were looting stores and carrying out televisions because they were mad. <laughs> what? They didn't have a vision of the future. Proverbs 28 says this, without a vision, without eyes that see, People wander around aimlessly, kind of like preschoolers, herding turtles. I love watching our preschool, preschool teachers. Hey, come back. Without a vision, people wander around aimlessly. We need a vision of what God has for us as his people. We need a, a vision of what God has for us as his people. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says this, all authority, Jesus is speaking, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's why he's seated at the right hand of the Father because all authority has been given to him. Verse 19 says, therefore, or go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, and that is a proper word. Some translations do not have that. I am with you always to the end of the age. The word behold there in the Greek means to see with the mind or to spiritually see. Behold there means to perceive with inward spiritual perception. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, behold, see with your spiritual eyes and perceive and actually experience that I am with you. Hope is founded in emotion. Hope is founded in an experience with Christ. Paul said it this way, I want to know him. He wasn't talking about, hi, how are you? He was talking about an experience where it changed his vision. Church, what our prayer should be is this, God, give us a vision of the hope that you have for us. Lord, help us to experience your goodness. Lord, help us to experience your mercy. God, help us to experience your grace. Lord, help us to experience your love. We want to know you. That's a little different, amen? If our worship team would come back. Behold, I am with you.
You see, the lens of hope is not merely optimism. It's not, well, I'm kind of an optimist in a way. Right, Lisa? Yes, she said. <laughs> but the lens of hope is not merely optimism. It's not, ah, you know, it can't get any worse. Yes, it can. <laughs> In fact, Jesus clearly tells us at the end of the age it's going to get worse. But hope is the exceeding expectation that God has something stored up for you that's better than what you have now. That's hope. And church, we need to be all about the hope that Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. There's going to be a moment when he returns and we will be with him. Hallelujah. I'm skipping a whole lot, but that's all right. I'm just going to go right to the end. That's how I read most books. <laughs> Somebody asked me, how many books are you reading? I said, 20. Because I just read parts of a lot of different books. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to close with this. You don't have to put that up there. You can go on to their song that they're going to do. Second Corinthians chapter 4. I had a lot on my heart and my spirit, and I didn't really know where God was going to lead. I tried to discern that. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse seven. Did you know you're a jar of clay? You're a jar of clay. Verse 7 says this, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. What treasure? The hope of glory. Jesus is our treasure. In this, in this jar of clay, we have a treasure to show, <laughs> to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. In your weakness, he's made strong. In your failing, he's made you more than a conqueror. In your past, he says, guess what? I'm gonna erase it as far as the east is from the west. And when you remind me of it, I'm gonna say, I don't even know what you're talking about. We have this treasure in jars of clay. And it shows the surpassing greatness of our God. Church, we have hope. We have hope beyond hope. Romans tells us to hope against hope. Verse 8 says, We are afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed but we are not driven to despair. On the Sunday that we flew out of, or the Monday, excuse me, that we flew out of Portland International Airport in Burkina Faso, some Muslims from Nigeria entered the country and went to a church where an Assembly of God pastor was, and they drug he and his family out in the street and they killed him. I wonder how many are going to take his place. I bet they're lined up. We're struck down, but we are not destroyed. Church, get a hold of this. 
We always carry in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our bodies because he died, because he lives. When you die, you live. The hope of the resurrection. If you don't have a hope of a resurrection, church, we're done. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he lives, Christ is enough for me. The hope that we have in Jesus Christ, the world needs. Let your faith rise. Let your hope meter go off the scale. Jesus is enough, amen? He's enough. Would you stand with me? See, Pastor, I'm not sure if I understand what you're trying to say. Here's what I'm trying to say. Regardless of your circumstance, regardless of your situation, regardless of your past, regardless of the struggles that you face today or the struggles that you will face tomorrow, Christ is enough. When we look all around us, we see trouble on every side. How many would just lift your hand and say, you know what, Pastor? Yeah, I'm in some trouble. There's things that I need hope in. Yeah, all around this place. All around. Somebody told me this week, they said, getting old, pardon me, really sucks. That's what they said. <laughs> you're going to have a new body. If you're old, if you're in a wheelchair, if you have a cane, if you're sick, you're going to have a brand new body. You're going to have a glorified body. That's the hope that we have, church. That's the hope that we have. Christ is our hope. Yesterday, in the mountains, Rick Stevens lost his life in a snowmobiling accident, an avalanche. The Baines and their family are close to them. Life's but a vapor. But we have hope. Our hope is in Christ alone. We're going to pray for them. If you're, if you're here this morning and you're like, man, I need hope. I want to pray for you. We don't want you to go. We don't want you to go without receiving the hope that God has for you. Do you believe that? Jesus simply asked his disciples, he said this. He said, do you believe? Do you believe? Church, let your faith arise. Have that quiet, confident hope that God is going to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think. God, our hope is in you. We're going to make this place a house of prayer. And we're not going to respond to the altar this morning in the way that we did last week, but we're going to respond by having people pray for us if we could be so bold today. Pastor, I'm uncomfortable with that. I'm not saying that you have to do that. I'm not saying you have to do that. But what I am asking is that you would simply, when hands are raised, if you, if you want to respond or if you want to pray for somebody else, that you would go to that person. Ken and Christy, you're over here to my right. They need us to stand with them in prayer. There's hope that needs to be shed abroad. Are there others that would say, Pastor, I have, I have some needs that I really need somebody to pray with me for. Look at all around, back there, here, here. Keep your hands up. Would you begin just to, as the family of God, begin to move out? Be specific, ask them what you're praying for, and then pray for hope that there would be a certain expectation that God is going to do something. Are there others this morning?
you move out if people are raising their hands? I can't really see. Right here in the front, right there in the front. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you are our hope. All our fountains are in you, Jesus.